to see him into the lineup. Remember that Damwon Gaming on blue side have punch in the lineup, so we know he is that Lee Sin guard so far this season, but it's one of those scenarios where they bring in Nogari, who usually gets a lot of top lane bans, but Nogari's been in and out, so maybe you can drop some of those bans. You bring in punch, and Sandboss can choose do we dangle the Lee Sin and get two Bonanza picks in the first round, or do we just straight up ban it? On the red side, you have less flexibility, but there still is on patch 9.4 with a kind of unexplored what should be first pick scenario, the chance to trade Lee Sin for Zoe or other picks that are frequently banned in the first round. We see Lucian banned out as he seems to always be first time on the red side, but will have Jace banned again. Yeah, you don't dangle that one against yeah. Nogari. He's really good at that. The Rise is another one that you never want to really live up against Nogari Showmaker version of Damwon Gaming, but see how much flexibility there is to make a play like that. Sandra already banned on the blue side. See how Damwon Gaming want to approach. On fleek bans are what a lot of teams do. Feels like it's too late for a ghost ban, and Damwon actually on blue side don't want to give away a red side two-pick rise. So you're actually going to have to ban rise on blue. It is a dove favorite as much as it is a Nogari and Showmaker favorite. You can see he's actually does not look super happy about that one, but we were talking about LeBlanc too. Does end up picking up its eighth win on these two mid laners. We'll see if Sandbox lets it go through here down to the last ban. LeBlanc, Zoe, both available on a frequent mid lane matchup that's been going more and more towards the Zoe over time. So that's why the LeBlanc first pick might actually be surprising. The Vladimir is left open and they just snatch it. They go for a first pick top laner on the blue side with Nogari. Outside chance that Nuclear or Showmaker could be playing it. Heavily expecting this to be a top lane Vladimir. Nogari was the one who innovated the new rune choice in order to get the most power out of Vladimir early, going for the 5% CDR and the Inspiration Tree. 10% CDR, Transcendence Rune in Sorcery, and the Scaling CDR in the first rune stats to get 25 plus percent for free. But I see you shake your head because you have been lamenting all the Silas. I'm on the Silas hype train purely because I've seen it work in other regions, and I feel like the macro around Silas has been the problem in LCK. So who knows? Maybe we'll see a Silas win and finally get you some confidence, Valdez, stat on this Silas pick. Well, I'm at least happy that they do follow it up with LeBlanc and they don't make the same mistake that Dom1 made. Imagine Vlad and LeBlanc on the same team. Would have been kind of scary. LeBlanc going up to 68% yeah. win rate after the win that Dove was able to pilot it to in game number one. Is going to get a second chance here in game two. And we've been wondering where our boy Rek'Sai is at. I guess I, our girl is probably the way to go, but you know how the adage goes. Yeah, I gave you a little look there. Uh, Rek'Sai is being hovered by Punch. It's definitely an old pick for him, but didn't fire on this pick last time, and the Lee Sin is gone. So you wonder if he has to just go for a first round Rek'Sai here to try to get the sort of skirmishing advantage that champions like Olaf and Lee Sin usually provide him. Rek'Sai would be very hard to answer in terms of 2v2 early skirmishing. A lot of teams go Nocturne into Rek'Sai, try to avoid her positions of power, and then make a global play and we do just see the Nocturne as the instant answer in the first round. It was a, probably a very likely ban if they didn't take it. Does get snatched up here, which means that we have both solo lanes and the junglers taken. Most likely, you know, as we were mentioning, some of these picks can be flexed, but this is most likely we should just see the bottom lanes picked here in the second phase, which doesn't always happen. Tom Kench, definitely very high up on the tier list for the bottom lane, will be taken away. And you have to think about what the completed duos will be on the down one side, because they'll be locking in bot lane at the same time, and what Sandbox can get as a advantage, i.e. a support that can't be answered, or an AD carry that can flexibly take any support and win a matchup here. So Alistair, bigger pick for down one than it is for Sandbox. Thresh is usually the go-to support here, even after the nerfs for Joker, but the Morgana is his more, more famous pick. So we're seeing a lot of bands targeted to this, like we mentioned, Hoyt's Alistair's band away. Will we see a Morgana or a Thresh ban from Dom One Gaming? Kind of two different poisons you can take. In fact, it's neither. Will be the Galio ban. The analyst desk on the Korean side pre-series was talking about how Galio's an eight match losing streak in the support role, but it does have that great synergy with Nocturne, and these two bands of Dom One Gaming do shut down Onflake's playmaking ability come level six. 
Yeah, I do like the idea, but it does leave that support role heavily banned. And if you are on the red side, you'll want to take the best support remaining, which seems to be Braum in this case. And you go support first because you want to threaten Draven as a last pick here. So as Damwon Gaming needs to find a duo that doesn't get slammed by Draven. It's not that easy, right? Braum isn't necessarily BFF with the Draven, but can, of course, synergize quite well. So now Damwon Gaming. What are they going to look for as a blind duo? Callista Thresh would be a very popular choice, but it's into Nocturne, and we know compositionally Callista can heavily struggle against Nocturne Dive as the game goes on, and LeBlanc will be there to assist it. So what will the duo be? Zaya Rakan would have for sure been down one game's go-to in the first round. Remember, they were 4-0 on Zaya Rakan as a duo, but the Rakan buffs are not in until patch 9.5. So it's going to be Thresh and Zaya to find the most flexible duo and to lift off through the Nocturne and LeBlanc dive. Now answering question is on to Sandbox. Ghost just took down an Ezreal. Will he be locking it in? The answer is yes. Fourth Ezreal game, two and one on the season so far for Ghost. Yeah, Ezreal, you know, obviously extremely high tier on uh, 9.4, so they're gonna snatch that one up. Hearts out to Austria. I like that one. Shout out to Austria, almost as good as Australia, but a very similar name. <laughs> I always see Australia yeah. and then update it to Austria, because of course, you know, I've seen A-U-S-T-R a lot in my life True. as an Australian. Yeah. End result here, Sandbox Gaming. I think they have quite a lot of power here. They have dive threat, but I like the Zaya Thresh. Given everything we were talking about, don't want to get slammed by Draven. Need to find something strong, have to respect the dive. I think Damwon Gaming approached the second round very intelligently. But they're the ones that have changed three pieces. Sandbox just want to rinse and repeat what they did in game number one. So we'll see how this new lineup of Damwon Gaming can come together and see if we finally see the Rek'Sai pop-off we alluded to a week ago. I mean, you take a look at the top side of the map already and you have to feel pretty good. Nuggery gets right back onto his Vladimir once again. And Showmaker hops onto Zoe which is definitely another one of those playmaking champions for him. And Rek'Sai once again, looking for some success this time around in the hands of Punch. Fun matchups here. The LeBlanc always going to be a highlight this time from Dove. Let's see how Nocturne Silas as a duo do. Because remember, it's not going to be Silas with an Olaf, so he can just overextend for days. It's going to be much more about respecting the pressure of the enemy team here. Top of the table clash, Sandbox Gaming just want to close out 2-0, but Damwon Gaming looking to fight back. Here we go guys, right back onto the rift. Game number one, relatively short, only about 31 minutes, very one-sided after the dominoes started tumbling. We'll see if this game holds a similar path. What are you thinking about these comps here, Papa? So I've actually got my magnifying glass on a couple of matchups. And the main one for me is this mid lane matchup, as we see happily the pool party Zoe skipping around. Zoe versus LeBlanc, if you ask any Korean mid laner, if you talk to people in solo queue, was a LeBlanc winning matchup at the start of the season. We definitely saw some pop off LeBlancs, but over time and increasingly around the world, people are seeing that Zoe played at 100% against LeBlanc at 100%, Zoe actually wins that matchup because you have tools to answer. You just have to hit him, right? You need to hit the bubble yeah. when LeBlanc comes in. Because it's Showmaker who's largely been in really good form against Dove here, I want to see if Showmaker can actually prove that in a matchup that from time to time has veered left and right. Let's see if the 9.4 Week 7 analysis of Zoe drinking well in this matchup actually can. See a couple of first picks. I actually do love this CG uh, here from Riot as Punch and Hoyt going to be hopping on to Rek'Sai and Thrash for the first time. A lot actually happened at the level one. Sandbox got a leash in and didn't get cheese because they put down a lane brush for the camp coming in from Zaya and Thrash. That lets you know they assumed that Hoyt and Nuclear would enter lane with no leash to try to find push priority. Obviously, level two is so important to any duo lane, but it gives Nuclear so much more lane presence when you can threaten the Blade Caller. Looking at the runes, Nogari has notably gone for the Klepto in this game. Has gone Kleptomancy. It's a melee matchup, trying to farm it out. 
So the leash there, I assume, was to allow Onfleet to get to the scuttle fast, and that means that Punch, with no leash, just goes and contests. So ends up being the threatening of the double scuttle, and we should see a confirmation double scuttle, and maybe more, as that ward just timed out. Punch knew about that ward as well, which is kind of interesting that he comes in here and challenges. Right as it does go down, Onfleet gonna spike his way in, but the popcorn chickens will go mainly the way of Punch here. He hits level three and says, man, this is my jungle now. And he's getting super aggressive. Red buff on blue buff as well means that he can trade quite well in here onto on Fleek, but level three is hit. Fear comes in onto Punch, which means that he will back away. Ooh, missed Paddle Star there, but nice dodge on the chains by Showmaker. A lot happening in that trade between the mid and jungle combos. Yeah, the mid was what we had zoomed out on, but that's why Punch was so happy to push in, because early LeBlanc can't have that presence onto a Zoe. They have the ability to wave clear and harass much more reliably as the Zoe side of the matchup, so that's why I had the priority to do it, and also the increased camps in the early game, and it will be the double scuttle at minimum, a product of this Zoe draft that we've been alluding to. It's the most annoying thing in the world as a mid laner when you have this giant wave pushing into you, but you have to back away from it just to help your jungler. And it doesn't stop there. You talked about double jungle, but Punch is already once yep. again in his face, not letting up on this one. But here comes Summon, tries to flash away, but now he's just in a world of hurt as he went too far. First blood goes to on fleet. And that's the part where Dom One Gaming make a mistake. They're trying to be bold. They're trying to invade around the Rek'Sai skirmishing advantage, but Sandbox Gaming, just like the level one ward on the bra, have scouted out and have anticipated this level of aggression. It's just not as clean as what we see from some other teams in the league. So it's one of those invading without priority in all your lanes. Yes, Zoe's coming fast, but Summit is coming and Nogari is not. We know that Nogari as a player plays oh. for his lane and that's going to be the cost here for Punch. You see he flashed to his tunnel, but as he was entering it, the knockup yep. from Summit, he said, nah. -uh. And it turns out that Summit's timing becomes the MVP of that gank and the kill going the way of the Nocturne. One of the first times my view of the game was really challenged when I was just a viewer, before I was ever a caster, was when Diamond Prox, you know, was this big invading jungler as Shivana and gave the famous interview, I believe it was Diamond, I could be mistaken, but basically said, counter jungling is a team thing, not an individual thing. Don't praise me for it, it's a product of my team. Nogari was not backing up Punch on that invade, and if their goal was to get Punch into a huge lead, that should be your primary objective, not trying to deny half a minion wave from the enemy top laner. So a better team play from Sandbox, we already mentioned, they didn't change anything when it came to their players on the rift, and we're seeing some teething problems, and now Nogari just oh, having man. some straight up problems. Vlad here, only level five, but does have that sustain with the potion and the Q to come in just to save his life, but great trade already going the way of Summit. The maker gets the Ignite, gets to just thrift shop it through and get some priority in the mid lane, but yes. It's a very amusing top lane because every time you see Vlad or the Silas top lane, you're looking for healing reduction and amusingly, Nogari nor Summit can go into an Executioner's Calling. So this is a matchup that I think Summit will actually do pretty well on as the laning phase goes on. We'll see what he's maxing. I haven't been able to spot it yet. He could just go back to Kingslayer man, Max, but the amount of cooldown reduction that Vladimir gets does make it hard to out-sustain the poke trades. You only have the all-in trades that can go your way. I did, uh, well, we are seeing the Rek'Sai take the Ocean Drake right now extremely early, only about a minute after it did spawn. Joker will come in and spot it, but Punch Ooh. looks like he, <laughs> he got low. <laughs> He's down to 80. That was a interesting sound you made. Very enjoyable as the hook lands here, but of course they're not going to be diving anytime soon. But uh, during the break, I was talking about Silas and my heat of the champion currently. Um, in the LCK, you know, you were talking about some other regions, but in the LCK, I think it was something like only outside of two games, uh, the better team that should have won, should have won, was mainly dying with the Silas. I'm going to hold that thought as uh, Nuggery is getting ganked here. The fear into the knockup from the Silas means that he does get pretty low, but will get away. But generally, it was better teams losing with the Silas against teams they should have won against and the only times that the Silas was actually winning was from better teams against these teams that they should be beating anyway. So 
I'm still not convinced. Maybe Sandbox can add another uh, win to the scoreboard here if they do uh, get this win after Summit's good play in the top side. Hunch hasn't revealed himself that was a visual bug, in case you guys are wondering, Ooh. so it's in the brush there, but it's going to be the recalls from the enemy. I understand your point, and I think if you want to just base it on what we've seen in Korea, I'm 100% there with you. And maybe Silas will be a pick like Camille where... LCK just can't get the value out of it, the other regions do, but I tend to be glass half full. As we can see, a teleport here will zoom out on the Silas talk. Punch actually gets in there and steals it away without smite, it seems. Nice lantern as well to get him to safety, and the invade does work out. I think when it comes to Silas, the fact that we already have players who Silas we fear, I'm thinking of Chovy, as the bubble does land, remember our analysis about this lane, if you hit the bubbles, you win the lane matchup. So Showmaker finding a good moment there. But we already have players. We're like, ooh, do you really want to give Chovy Silas? And I think some people will say, oh, that's a Chovy thing. But it doesn't take a lot of skill to build Rod of Ages and some CDR and then steal an Alistar ult. And you know what I mean? And, and Frontline. But the ability for Silas in certain scenarios to pop up tells me this is a flexible champion. And it influences your opponent's draft. You lock in Silas, some people are saying words like Udyr and Zoe and things that compositionally answer the ultimate, right? Already, you're getting a mind game going. So I have a feeling the Silas is here to stay and will be a champion that is going to be the cornerstone of the meta without some nerfs. But I agree with you that a lot of Korean teams haven't been able to pull it off in the best light. Yeah, still waiting for it. And certainly once it does get behind, it uh, loses a bunch of its value. But we'll have to wait and see if from ahead, at least in the... Nice play that it made in this game. It can do something. It does help out in the first blood, but still sustaining some losses in the top lane, actually. About 18 CS down currently on the black. See where these comps are going. Vladimir usually heralds an outscale of a comp, but it's dive versus Vladimir and kind of a siege comp, right? So it's kind of very interesting composition where they took Nogari, a Vladimir power pick, and yes, Nogari can just straight up win the game, but it's not like it's a dive comp from Damwon that will hard out scale in the late game. It's a dive Vlad and some good setup around it. So if you can stay ahead of Silas in the 1v1, then yes, you get the best of both worlds where the four members of Damwon siege up and the wave clear is not great on the side of Sandbox. The wrong all in, they lose. But if the Silas can find a steadying point, then things become more competitive, so... We still like what Dom One is fielding. We love the fact that they're not in a gold disadvantage like they were in game number one, but it feels like this game is still up there to be won 10 minutes in. They get that nice ocean drake to start this off extremely early on in the game means that all the lanes are gonna benefit from that extra regen, especially in the mid lane that you were talking about where the Zoe does seem to, to be the winning matchup nowadays but uh, can benefit even more from that regen. As on fleek, still looking for his first paranoia in this game, you can see he was hanging around the mid lane as Dub was trying to bait a fight that eventually didn't work out, but still no paranoia has come in here, and that is kind of worrying when you are running that Nocturne. And if I think about how Sandbox would win this game, I think about how they'll have that cheaper two item spike onto Ghost, and. It's going to be, of course, the Essence Reaver build, so it takes a while to get going for Nuclear. And it's the fact that Zoe's side lane might actually be shut down by both LeBlanc and the Silas, who can build double MR, because, of course, it's against both Vladimir and the Zoe. So there's definitely a mid-game window where the items might just come together better for Sandbox, and that's where they win, get a 20-minute Baron again, and close the game. Otherwise, a lot to like around Damwon, and they also have that Rek'Sai. Hasn't done that much. Has gotten some camps, has gotten three camp lead, but has died also. And now we're in that wheelhouse where the paranoia is something that's very difficult for Punch to emulate. I mean, you can see that on fleek was looking for that opportunity in the top side, but it is a Vladimir, so even if you do land it, you don't exactly know where the Rek'Sai is. If any kind of counter gain comes into a Vlad that's level nine, and you use that paranoia, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So they just decide against it. And we will continue to have this passivity for now as neither team finding much action after the early game. We saw the runes earlier. It is domination seconds. So there isn't gonna be the sorcery 10% CDR. So it's not 45% CDR about a mirror at 11, level 11. So gonna be a little bit lower on the lane abusing. But on actually looking to stop the dragon stacking here. They've got control bot side of the map. It's just. Kind of slipped away from the fingers of Dumb One Gaming. 
On Fake, got the Drake down below 1,000. Spike comes in. Cloud Drake does go their way with a Mountain Drake up next. Now on Fleek in an awkward spot. May just have to go forward straight onto the Thresh here. But Aftershock and a stopwatch is going to keep him alive for so long. Already the Nocturne goes down and Summit going to be baited into this one as well. Should be going down here. Just gets sniped there by Showmaker looking for another one on the back side, but will just be the two kills going the way of Damo. And Nogari actually teleports down late because the paranoia locked him out from doing so. But actually, he could have kept the teleport and they got two kills bot side. So it's a really big win for Damon that amusing could have been even bigger because Sandbox are forced into a rush all in with their paranoia TP advantage and yet it's turned against them. Zoe pick, you can see what it's doing in the mid lane, but also just trying to zone out on Fleek forces him to go straight to a threat. And they get the TP advantage, but think of all the tools that are used here by Sandbox, and it just ends up being a trade as the fight goes on. Summit ends up dying on this teleport here, so that's the two kills to get them back in. One trade kill not worth the teleport, that gets no kill involvement from Nogari. Fortunately, as Summit was going in, the rest of his team kind of backing away as the Nocturne was already going down. So, see a bit of the gold differences already in the top lane. The Vladimir, a thousand gold ahead at 13 and a half minutes over the Silas here. And you can't go Rod of Ages from this far behind in this build against the double AP. So, it's kind of priced in to go for the build I know LS likes a lot less, which is the Proto Bell into situational build. I think it's vindicated here because otherwise you're just really really losing while the rod of ages is put together so you need something to at least pretend you're going to fight back but is it going to be too little too late they're already investing joker's time to try to end this laning phase or at least keep some pressure on denogger didn't help out in the first blood but ends up dominating the lane anyway that is Nuggeries, Vlad here, a scary proposition. They let him have it. They banned out the Lee Sin instead, away from Punch. And so Damon said, okay, we'll just pick up Nuggeries, Vlad, and thank you very much. So far, it's been looking quite good. You assume first the question was, do we have a pick to hold it, rather than just can we respond to it? They should not have been surprised to see the Vladimir priority, and it's, it's an Ogre, a player who's performed on it again and again. Smite from Punch actually gets the red, but we're seeing Nocturne brawl with him. He's trying to get in there, doesn't have much mana, but the fear comes down, but in goes the Rexile, but perfectly Back timed up. stopwatch as the battle star from Showmaker from downtown uses his own flash to make that a one for one. And those extra tools makes it hard to evaluate, but you definitely feel good as the Rexile, she was looking like lights out in that scenario, but the R actually immuning the damage bought enough time for Zoe to respond and gets that one for one. A really nice mechanical play there from the side of Dom1 to make the most out of a bad situation. They'll keep that lead going. They have a two and zero Zoe now, and it's Showmaker just dominating Dove in the mid lane too. And I love little plays like that. Same mechanic as the Alpha Strike, right? Where you just time it right and you immune damage. But we see with the Rek'Sai side pretty reliably. And that's what allows her to get the trade kill that bought so much time, about three and a half seconds of time between the stasis and that. We're in mid lane, didn't use Nocturne ult, remember? Yeah, they have a ton of burst damage here too, but the stopwatch comes in and he is able to swipe there now. on top of him. Okay, in goes Dove again and Punch has to flash away just to survive, so a nice Clap back there from Dovin on Fleet. And because Rek'Sai never got to extend that lead in the 1v1 when she wanted to invade earlier, now we get to the point where it's the same analysis as Nocturne versus Callista. Nocturne versus Zoe, right? Zoe's skipping away with her portal jump, ain't gonna do nothing against the Nocturne dive. So Nocturne finds a way to trade his life for Zoe's every fight. That's advantage, Sandbox Gaming. Definitely a feels good moment for Sandbox to try to come back in this one as now Joker is getting really frisky. Gets the knock up onto the Zion. Lantern will get him away as well. Damon just going for Shelly here. Kind of bizarre use of the ult from Hoyt there. They just ended up drawing a response ult from Joker. They didn't know about the positioning of junglers. We know junglers weren't in response range on either threat. Gonna watch the replay of the top side. Loving the R timing from the Rex side here. So on Fleek, because he's got the lethal tempo, says, let's brawl, I'm ready to go, I got backup. Watch the play here, Dove comes in, would have killed. 
the Rek'Sai R's through the damage into Stasis, and with the actual flash, true flash used by Showmaker, mm -hmm. they need a lot, but Valdez, what doesn't Zoe have now? The flash that she needed to pick up the kill, and that's why the response gun almost a double is available for Sandbox Gaming, so they next level what Damon Gaming was trying to do. It really is a great point. I mean, on fleet goes from dying. The second he comes back alive, he just runs down the mid lane and says, we are killing the guy that doesn't have flash and no escape. So definitely a great move from them, but now they're struggling to try to take this Mountain Drake away. Now that's walking down. Will they try to get in range? There it is, but no, the spike not gonna go away. And the two man play comes in from the side of point means that already Nocturne is going to be going down. And Punch trying to finish him off. It is going to be the double kill going to Showmaker. So two kills and the Mountain Drake go the way of Damwon Gaming. And Damwon Gaming, he's playing Sandbox walking up. And speaking of Damwon Gaming, Nagori is going to ult to get them away. Both top laners missing. And I think Sandbox overrate the position they're in. They get no Nocturne Paranoia value. I believe might have been on cooldown. Certainly wasn't used. Damwon Gaming get everything once again. They're going to push up and get the first turret of the game as well. Should be a huge swing to go to the side of Damwon after that play as, well, just a response Emo play trying to push them off the turret here alongside with the Proto Belt, but it's not pushing them away. They're going to get that first blood turret. Uh, actually, that's the second turret already that they have taken here. They got Bottom one already gone on the map. They got Drake, Blue Buff Steel, and two turrets and two kills. They got so much from this play. And you think about where Sandbox are in the game, remember? It's no Muramana, two item Ezreal. So he wants to be in the mid lane. That's where Ezreal is strong at this point. The LeBlanc has one item. She can burst one person. But that's not team fight strength. That's pick strength. So Sandbox walking up to contest here is pretty bizarre. They get no value out of the power they have right now. And they actually kind of just accept their fate. Blink and you miss it. Valdez, it's a 5,000 gold lead almost for Dom One Gaming. Kind of gift wrapped by the side of Sandbox. On Fleek, you were talking about the paranoia. It didn't look like it was available. He had to flash in for that one. You would imagine that he would use paranoia to just get in range if he had it. So gets too close, doesn't get the smite, gets played and knocked up. So he can't even use any of his abilities and does no damage. And talk about the importance of Mountain Drake. You can see it in the desperation of Sandbox to try to steal it away. Definitely the worst early game play we've seen from Sandbox in multiple series. The fact that they lost that much, and it should have been worse. Nogari was actually closer to the fight than Silas as a more team fight ready champion as well. If this was a... Uh, they should be happy they only lost 5,000 gold. It could have been way more in that play. And now the Rift Herald is there. Now a lot of our points about where the game state is at are going to be thrown off by the extra gold and the extra objectives. Loaded in, Damwon Gaming take the third out of turret. And it feels like Sandbox are ready. It backs against the wall. Doesn't stop there as Shelly trying to get a second charge here. Will not be able to, but already Showmaker with the Banshee Veil on top of Ludens at 20 minutes. That's a really happy Zoe. She's skipping a lot more now after having all of these items, and it's just going to be a menace here in the mid-game. Win lane, win game is a possibility for Zoe in the LeBlanc matchup, which does confirm our recent analysis about where that matchup is tipping. That is a huge item break point. To have Mercs and Banshee Veil complete here means that she doesn't care about Zoe unless she's heavily overextended in a side lane. And right now, those side lanes, she can just wait for the minion wave to be frozen or slowly push towards the turret, then relieve pressure rather than have a very long lane with her own turret down. Facing on to nuclear, but doesn't have to use the ult. They get the trade now, and maybe Nocturne can punish it in the next minute or so. Yeah, Joker happy about that one. Probably looking for a little bit more as Dove's sustaining some damage here, just trying to clear out that control ward. We're definitely going to see more of Zoe versus LeBlanc in the response. It felt good, you know, Dove picked up a win and then he gets it again, but then immediately now Showmaker comes in and proves to everybody just how strong that Zoe can be in this matchup. LeBlanc, I suppose, sometimes a little bit too linear. You have to stay there for, you know, even just one second to get your damage trade in, and the Zoe can just throw out some of her own linear skills to shoot you in the face. But let's go back to the draft with our new information and say, first pick Vladimir for top almost certainly is winning the top lane matchup by a lot of gold with the Kleptomancy. So go for extra winning, right? The Kleptomancy. And then Showmaker's winning this ma skill matchup that clearly seems to be trending towards the Zoe. 
that's some pretty worrying signs for Sandbox when it comes to their usual style. They are one of our teams that almost always draws for lane strength, unlike Gryphon that can take the more greedy scaling approach. And we're not even sure that scaling is going to be paid off in a significant manner. They weren't able to use where Ezreal is strong against Zaya, and now with all the gold that's gone the way of Nuclear and his 550 gold of farm and kill bounty, feels like the Zaya just has straight up more power. So it's actually very little for Onflake and the members of Sandbox to pose questions on. It actually has to be things like Joker trading his ult with Nuclears and then calling in the Nocturnes. We're already talking two-step, three-step plans to even get even trades. Poor Joker has to cleanse away from that one. They get that information now, and Showmaker gonna take his own cleanse on top of a Banshee Veil. You're not touching this, Zoe. She, she, you know, she's gonna have her way on the Rift here to essentially do whatever she wants, has a needlessly large rod. I predict there'll be at least one team it's, fight where you singing can't touch this will be better play-by-play -play than play-by-play -play in the fight. She's gonna be that strong. It could happen. Could definitely happen here. How's your singing voice? Is that, is that in your... You know, your it's all right. All right. You and I haven't, uh, we haven't done karaoke together just yet. As, uh, well, that does a lot of damage. You can see maybe in the future the Ezreal can do a bit. As, uh, working on the third item now. Towards the Archangels. I wonder if it's the lights out choice, because it kind of can be either. Nuclear's far enough ahead that you could close out the game with an early IE or go the ghost route and go GA and frontline a bit more and try to bait with your ult and also your guardian angel. So a lot of options available here for Nuclear. Might even just be a gold back timing thing. He's pushing up, doesn't give too many mundos about Summit, as you can tell. That's magic resist, not armor onto Summit. He's got a lot of magic resist to face off against Vlad, but not up against Isaiah, obviously. And of course, you know, Vlad Zoe, that is double AP. Oh, it's the right choice, and yet, yeah. Damon Gaming can make it wrong, right? And that's what happens when you're this far ahead. Your lane assignments are so flexible now. Yeah. From a 6,000 gold lead, Sandbox Gaming. They're trying something, they're rolling all the die. Okay, well, I said he couldn't touch the Zoe. It looks like I might be correct. No, he's going to be shut down there. As only the DA might be going down. Already two kills. The way of Sandbox is they're trying to shut it down, but Summit may be going a little bit King too Slayer, far is here. There? No. is going to be able to shut him down. And Nogari, oh boy, here he comes. Should be able to get at least Joker and do a lot more damage. So they do train a couple back will be a two for two in the end. Two for two at that point in the game with how far behind they were and how the game was slipping away from them is actually good for Sandbox. And if Kingslayer comes off cooldown, that would actually be an insane heal. Remember, it's AP with Spirit Visage uh -huh. onto the Silas, but doesn't quite get it at the end. This is what you can do. The only thing they can do is press Nocturne ult and group. They will have a TP advantage or a grouping advantage because there's no way for Vladimir to teleport in that scenario. And Nogari famous, of course, for being second there. Silas probably a second or two away from living and potentially posing more questions. Nogari only gets Joker. It certainly could have been worse. Wasn't a big fan of the Zaya ult usage by Summit that he did steal as a Nuclear easily disabled a sidestep in the little nook in the jungle there and avoid all that damage. And after he used that, he had no escape when he was going 1v2. You mentioned it was probably a cooldown issue. Didn't seem like he had the Kingslayer, but maybe he should have saved that for a better position. Does mean he does go down in the end, as he was just looking to zone away the Zaya. I have an important update. Showmaker went for the budget GA full-powered IE. He has the Infinity Edge done, and he has the stopwatch. So he is a nuclear, I should say. So he's really strong at this one. The Zaya is to be feared. And even if they recreate these dives, Zaya is uniquely strong at dealing with things like Nocturne Ultimate, so the threat of this Zaya carrying a fight is high, and we already outlined the position that Showmaker is in, so Sandbox Gaming need to find another window where they 5v4, because 5v5 ain't gonna work out. See what they can do here as the push does come in. It looks like they may just go for an avoid. As Summit being zoned out on the bottom side, and LeBlanc is not even here. She's in the top lane, just split pushing. And they say, well, we're not going to go for any kind of 5v4 just yet. We'll just take out that outer turret in the top side and avoid all the fights up until then. Damwon Gaming haven't been a team that's been too dive happy, and your suspicion is, with Flame out, Nogari in, that some of the tight mid to late game shot calling will also be 
uh, evading this team. That was the big thing that Flames Introduction, if you talk to the players, if you listen to the interviews, all about giving that veteran shot calling ability. Let's watch this matchup get oh the boy. Nocturne. Hemo Plague Got it. that. Okay, in goes Nocturne and enough. Amplified damage goes on top of that flat to the point that even he can't survive. The control ward line actually extends to Cam, so they had no idea which side the map Nocturne is on. And remember that if Nocturne Tether goes on to a Vladimir, it will apply in the f it, during the pool. There's no way to kite away from that. You have to use the pool at the right time. Did in that scenario, the Nocturne gets the job done. A nice piggyback gang with no Baron punish from Damwon Gaming. It was a lot of stuff there, just a little bit too far forward from Nuggery. Good positioning by On Fleek, and no flash as well on Nuggery, which is probably communicated to make that gank even easier. And what do you always want to do up against Nuggery? You want to punish his overstaying in some of those side lanes and some of that selfish side laning. Well, they're able to do that here already with the kill and a turret in the bottom lane. And it's a play style. It's a point where in game number one, maybe Sandbox can't fight back. But with the members, again, with the nameplates on, this is a scenario where outplaying Dumb One Gaming on the map is possible because so frequently, even before Flame wasn't there, we would look at these game states and say that Dumb One didn't have the macro to close out games like this. They needed to brush up and harness their smart coaching staff in order to belie the fact that they had a lot of talented solo queue members that weren't as on point with the map rotations. So given all that, let's see how many times they can use the TP advantage that the Paranoia causes or just the piggyback advantage to take down side lane members and drag this game on to maybe just a single team fight they can win. Mountain Drake, a huge objective here. Unbreakable, going to have to be used already by Joker, but level 16 for both Nuggery and Dove, pretty big. In terms of both of those champions, we'll see if Sandbox even want to contest here. As the Ezreal ultimate does come through, backs Stomp on Gaming off quite a bit here. As in goes on Fleek. No unique vision. There's a control ward vision on Damon Gaming's forward ward above this spot and matching control wards on the right. So let's see if it's an honest 5v5 or maybe even a steal. Hey, can they get in there? Here comes the red side. It's going to reset and in goes on Fleek. He gets it this time. The Hemo Plague is good by Nuggery. Look at all that damage into the back line, but Punch getting low and Summit. Looks like maybe he bit off a little bit too much. Just coming in from behind as his team was backing away. Only he will go down, though. Mountain Drake goes the way of Sandbox, but down one heading immediately to Baron. And you see how tricky it is to approach a fight, especially with Hema Plague used so early, and to actually hard engage. Summit's the only frontliner. He goes in and quickly turned on by the enemy. Down one trying to double down here and pick up the Baron. They lost out on the Drake. They love a Baron. Getting out to get the heal here on a punch as Punch just gets He's dead. He goes down, but no steal is going to come in as Ghost. He's beginning to get real strong. You can already see it. Uh-oh. Showmaker going to miss on that borrowed flash. But even so, they're out of position for the push in the mid lane. That means only four members have the Baron, and they lose a turret here. So they're trying to make this not the game-ending Baron buff power play that we saw in game number one. Important to note, though, Sandbox can still look to try to take down side laners, and the side laners will always have the Baron if we see an eventual 2v2 between, say, Zoe Rek'Sai as two members of Sandbox, or Vladimir Rek'Sai, given how much Nocturne side lane play has dragged this game on from a Sandbox perspective. On Fleek trying his very best, picked up Sterings now. Is quite tanky. Let's take another look at this play, though. Nocturne does claim the smite here. I don't actually see if it's engaged. This is always so awkward because Baron relays just the smite timing is off. The moment that Vlad ults three members, there's no way to actually be a backliner, so Summit actually goes too far. With the stolen Rek'Sai ult, no one can walk past. Nogari, that's impossible. Let's watch here the Ezreal ult. Even through the redemption here, let's see how much damage it does. Yeah, it does an extra 500 and then just a cheeky auto attack from the Rex, uh, from the uh, Baron takes it down there. So we zoom out, we do see a mid lane turret, only a thousand Baron buff power play so far. The gold lead has narrowed since all this play has happened when it looks like Dumb One Gaming were maybe in a no lose scenario. That it has, it is getting pretty interesting. There is still a chance that Sandbox could come back, but Dumb One now with the Baron buff looking for a big power play here. They already get that bottom turret. On the side of Nuggery. And you wonder if maybe this is play one lane okay. dive. Is, speaking of dive. Trying to get onto Showmaker again. That huge amount of damage. 
from the Ezreal means that two members immediately go down as Dove also going in for the kill. It's Nuclear and he's all alone. Will go Nuclear as he goes down. Nuggery, the last man remaining. And he's got a, a oh, Nemo he's... Blade and a Dream. Can he do this actually on Fleet? Gonna mess up that uh, spell shield How many can Nuggery take down here? Lee's gonna go on top of him. Second one does come in. A bit of a monk ass moment, but five members do go down on the side of Dom on a sandbox straight back. It is a monk ass moment. They were so far ahead with Baron and they just lost a team fight. I was just about to say, maybe this is where you play one lane and dive as Dumb One Gaming, because we already saw you're losing the game when Sandbox can split you away with the paranoia. Vladimir is in a side lane, and Dumb One Gaming just go up too far when they don't have Vladimir there to dive. This is not the time to walk up when your Vladimir is auto-attacking an inner turret, and they get punished in a pretty embarrassing fashion in this particular all-in. Get two members in there, all alone, and... And then I mean, you see Nogari, and you remember, hey, even if he was tanking turret and could recreate most of this play, if he has four members with him, three other people die, and you just win as Dumb One Gaming. Oh. Instead, they play okay. more players. Nice. Assist to the comms. Oh, no. nice, and then they're gonna go top. And the coach is actually creating a rumble here. What was that on the Richter scale on the side <laughs> of Sandbox? Their coach has always had some of the most visceral reactions. They know they were gifted that one by Dumb One Gaming, and that's quintessential Dumb One Gaming from ahead when they don't have flame on the roster they frequently make mistakes like this and it's worth noting they've clearly been giving scrim time to so many members of the roster if they were willing to sub in three new players for game number two yeah it is just a little bit of disrespect even if you are really far ahead with baron there's no messing with some of the late game damage of ezreal and the blanc they're just popping off so much ezreal's four zero and zero and four with a thousand gold bounty and four and a half items you can't just run straight at them they're gonna blow you up it does feel like ezreal at this item timing point has just out of nowhere sprung to ultra relevance. Notice double tier is done. He has the gun blade and sorcerer's shoes for just outrageous ult damage. If some Sandbox Gaming get the second Baron buff, I think they close out the game and Damon will be happy there's still two minutes till that's on the rim. Definitely a lot of the pressure relies, is lying rather on top of Nuggery who is that big side carry for them. Well, wield it as a weapon. No point sheathing Nogari, unleash him. That's what they have to do, is they have to play team fights. Here we go. Oh, big Hema play here on the side of Summit, but has to wait for that one. Huge Braum ultimate as it goes the Nocturne. But nice damage out of Nogari, he's still alive. He's gonna get a couple of kills here to the side of Dom1 Gaming, as even Summit is gonna go down. Goes desperately alone, trying to do that damage from behind, but even after the dive and so many ultimates, so much of Dom1 remains. And Sandbox Gaming choose to fight against Dom1, and they find out that Dom1 group is so different to Dom1 when the Nogari is not around. Nogari able to live through this. They can kite back, but they're not kiting back to friendly area just yet. Point doesn't feel strong enough to chase, and it should be some piggyback escapes, only at the cost of a further Mountain Drake to Dom1 Gaming. Forcing fights straight into a level 18 Vlad that is this fed. We've seen many times, doesn't seem to work out. And Sandbox have pick tools, they have outnumbered tools, but they don't have a champion like Vlad, who can press all his buttons and with multiple AoE spells, win a team fight. They think they have their moment to go in, and you see Doug get a mimic distortion, right? You think, is this gonna be enough? But the answer is no, that's not what they comp for. That's not what they've been gifted to get back into this game. So Dom1 Gaming finally, find a simple place to group around. We're actually seeing hopes and prayers from the fans there. Seeing the full roster. They've needed the full roster to get some of their victories. But Dom1 Gaming, in simple places where it's very easy macro to say, let's have five people park them together and fight, are finding victories. Let's see if Sandbox can play the map like they did in game number one to actually cause an outnumbered scenario because you know what? Even though they've lost out to a teleport advantage from Paranoia two or three times, Dumb One Gaming, you could see making the same mistake for a fourth or fifth time, and that's kind of what Sandbox has to hope for. It's what a lot of teams in the LCK already have won doing up against Dumb One Gaming, so I don't mind that. Maybe take a page out of their book, begin to split up the map, maybe send Dove to a side lane or something like that. 
has the ignite, not the teleport, so might be a little bit harder, but you know when you have the fed split pusher in solo queue, like your bot lane, your mid lane lost, but top lane's 8-0? And yes. the top lane just chooses to keep pushing around while you lose the four. This is where the four teammates have decided, why don't we just walk into the same lane as Nogari? That'll probably work out pretty well. They need Nogari there. Follow the leader, follow Nogari, is what Dumb One Gaming need to do. Because if they lose another fight in this series, because Nogari's not with them, that's on them. Summit comes in, steals an ultimate, but already sustains so much as Paranoia just coming in, but the Rex side going a little bit too far here. Punch not quite going to be sniped out as the True Shot Barrage goes the other way. But hanging on a knife edge was that fight as both junglers trying to play with fire here. Punch nearly losing his GA with the Baron available. And Joker actually has QSS and Cleanse on this Braum in order to walk up and have a cleanse effect. Maybe he chooses to swap over, maybe even if you keep Baron Steel. You can have QSS and also the Summoner change available from the Unsealed Spellbook. A lot of pick CC here. He's trying to ward Baron from behind against Zoe Thresh, so you know there's a lot of reliable ways to stop that Baron check. Speaking of Baron checks, Ghost can do it off cooldown with the Q. They well, know things are bad, and things are so fast! It's double mountain, and uh, don't care how much damage the LeBlanc does, you're not gonna be able to outsmite there as way too fast of a Baron. Sandbox not able to challenge that time around. You say that confidently, Valdez, but uh, I definitely saw Mimic Distortion still potentially come out. Mimic Distortion's probably not doing that much less damage than Smite at this point in the game. Punch one and six, but level 16. So I think 900 smite damage, I want to say. I think it's 1,000 at level 18, if I remember correctly. Not numbers I keep too close an eye on. Eye opening builds on both 80 carries. There's six of them for both. So both of them are super powered. And our read is that Dumb One Gaming's team fight comp is easier to execute. You can lift off with a GA as the Zaya, and you have Nogari, a champion who is better team fighter than anyone else on the rift right now. And yet, because of the nameplates, you wonder if Sandbox can find a way to turn the tables on Dumb One. With a Baron buff, you would hope the answer is no. Well, they certainly have a lot of ways to force fights with the Nocturne, LeBlanc, and an Ezreal to get in position and do damage, but they have to do it when the Vladimir is not there. And Vlad's items are great for team fights. Summit's items zone for a while, but not as much home for no death cap onto Dove just yet. Nogari's grouping here. Notice he's not sticking the side lane with that Baron buff. They're trying to play one lane. I like this from Dumb One. Not always the right way to go, but given how this series has gone so far, probably the right call. Oh boy, and Ghost even taking a huge amount of damage there from one panel star. Gotta be really careful. Summon and Dove trying to come from behind and make things interesting here. Remember, they don't want to fight 5v5 face roll. They want to find a pick. So actually trying to split them one, giving them headaches and also stopping further minion waves is smarter yeah. than trying to smork 5v5. Kind of like the idea. You know, you got to play guerrilla warfare when you are in this kind of situation. Shout out to Misfits. Yeah. <laughs> they play guerrilla warfare every game. I love those guerrilla pictures, man. Make my day every time. Well, yes. that's the Saturday yep. analysis point. It's Thursday. Is it Dumb One Gaming? Force in third game. Remember, they're on a six match win streak. The Sandbox Gaming is trying to engineer the downfall. Looks like that battle star kind of went through. Oh! That one is. Okay, Nuggery is not wasting any more time. Ghost just barely survives on the backside. In goes the Nocturne, but immediately blows up. Down goes Vlad, though. Okay, we do take that Vladimir away. Does that mean that Sandbox? have a way to get back into this one. Well, the Silas is gonna go down, as does Nocturne, and the Dominoes will fall. There are gonna be other threats in the lineup here from the side of Dom One, namely Showmaker and Nuclear at this point in time. And now it's only up to Ghost and Joker to try to stop them. Guerrilla Warfare is not gonna be enough to stop the winning army here. Showmaker piles on the damage, so does Nuclear, and Dom One Gaming will force game number three. 41 minutes, they are able to do it this time around. Will we go into a game three? As finally the series we were expecting does come to life here on the backs of Dom One and Vladimir. And just those full item builds short of the guerrilla warfare tactics were too strong. The tank on the Silas, the mana items that have already been piled on the Zaya, just things couldn't be made equivalent, and we have to remember this began with a Vlad first pick that we knew was top lane because it's Nogari, and then also the Zoe, and the answering picks in terms of 1v1 matchups couldn't be wielded enough 
on the side of Sandbox. Preseason and in Challengers, remember this is of course a rematch of a series that happened a couple of times in Challengers Korea. Summer 2018, that just the pure talent on the side of Dam1 honestly will be why you would have tipped them to beat Sandbox Gaming before 2019 kicked off. It ended up being about the talent and the laning matchups, and it's going to be something where we do expect these players to maintain their spots for Dam1. Sandbox Gaming cannot afford to give pretty comfortable laning matchups. The LeBlanc didn't work, and the Silas, it's another Silus in game number two. Another one comes in. I'm still not impressed. You got your blood pressure medication. You can take it after the cameras go off. You'll be fine. <laughs> It'll pick up a victory one day. Can we just not have it picked that no, early we, on? No, we will have it picked Can we early. just have something else? No, we will have it. I mean, ah, uh, OK. Well, the plan does go the way of Nuggery, and it, that was the nail in the coffin right from there, it felt like, as uh, we do have that game tied up, and we will have a game three which will make things kind of interesting as, once again, Sandbox will be on red side. And I would have to imagine that Vlad, as he was in game number one, will be banned out in game three. But it's red side on Nuggery. He can still find something. I'm ready for something crazy. The Nuggery Quinn is the one I am the most excited about. Nuggery did a boatload of damage, so did Ezreal, but he just knew with how the champions stacked up that if it was Vladimir doing 30k damage, that Vladimir team was going to win. They tried hard to make mistakes. They weren't perfect in their execution. You notice some peaks and valleys, even though they had a comp, they should have been able to close out the game. It extends to 41 minutes, but Dumb One Gaming did enough good things to force that game through. Yeah. A lot of the games where the Vlads do lose in the top lane are up against really oppressive laners like Jace. Turns out that Silas is not one of those laner guys, and uh, hopefully we see something new.